one of the and i heard you mention you know the increasing lifespan yeah one of the things that i sort of thought about is throughout history right and let's take the missions as an example <laughs> people would get married in their teenage years mm -hmm. because they would die in their late 20s sure. through the disease right sure so that's right. an example of where <laughs> right. having a short lifespan has mm -hmm. a material impact on how a person carries and oh. lives out their life when they're young right and one of the things that i've thought about is like now that lifespans are increasing and we right. as gen z are thinking okay we're going to live to be 120 what does that mean about what we should how sh we should approach being 20 and 30 because you know if i would imagine if you know i want to make a ton of money right and this is 20 30 years ago average lifespan is what 70 75 yeah, yeah. that makes it so that okay i really need to accelerate my work and just start focusing on building products and businesses as soon as possible yeah and there isn't much room there for taking two three four or five years to sort of well, meditate yeah. on ethical implications of business <laughs> or how my pursuit is going to affect others well, whereas now there seems to be this opportunity for gen z where it's like okay yeah. if our lifespan is really long yeah and i have a lot of time to sort of fail and learn Right. There's a lot of room for me to integrate uh, consideration of ethical implications of business right. into right. sort of my uh, educational nutrition, so to speak. Right. You know, it's funny. One of the, we talked about obituaries earlier, but one of the things that also fascinated me too is, you know, World War World War One. People get shot all the time. There was only sulfur drugs. There wasn't penicillin. Penicillin actually wasn't really broadly available until much later. So when you read an obituary from then, it's like, God, these people born in 1870. They could have been they could have died of a childhood disease like that and what was fascinating is all the stuff that they did they did by like 25 or 30. physicists will say do all your best work by the time you're 28 otherwise you're going to become a terror because you don't have a reputation to lose right mm. if you don't have a reputation to lose at a young age take a risk take a gamble and then you're going to be ossified and a boring old fart that's going to try and keep people from you know breaking rules don't be that person do your work when you're young now you know, it's like the foundation of a house, right? That's the most important structural element of the house. You can change the paint anytime. You can put a new window anytime. You can put an addition on. But if the foundation is bad, the whole house is bad. And it's the most expensive part to fix. And so that's kind of why, yeah, if you're going to be 120, you should, you, should, you should get out there and start your company now. But on the other hand, you do have time to get it right. And you want to build that foundation, those four corners. You want to have you know, a 365 degree view of the world. Um, and so you're going to have that time. I mean, I know I'm contradicting myself. It's 100 years ago, go by fast, but it's also time to get it right. Um, you know, my recommendation to people is, well, let me back up. Uh, the founder of Intel, a multi-billionaire by the name of Robert Noyce, once gave some advice to uh, the father of a friend of mine who was in a singing group with him. He was, among other things, being a genius in physics, he could sing. And he wanted to get some professional advice. This is back in the 60s. And he said, ah, five years. Never stayed at a company more than five years. It takes you a year to figure it out, another year to sort of figure it out. The third year, you're doing really well. Then you start to get bored in the fourth year. Then you're a waste of time to everybody in the fifth year. Okay, well, no one stays anywhere for five years anymore. So maybe, maybe it's three years. Stay somewhere, figure it out, get what you can out of it. They get the best of you, you get the best of them, and then, and then move on. You got to have that cadence in your mind, right? You've got to say to yourself that unless I start my own company, um, I'm going to work in two or three different industries over 100 years. I might be in energy, I might be in finance, I might be in pharma. And then you've got to decide, okay, I need these tools. You know, I need Python, I need SQL, whatever. But I also need deep domain knowledge because that's a commodity. You know, 50 years from now, the Python programmers are going to be in countries in, in Africa that are not doing well now financially. It's just going to move around the world, right? It's going to get, the technology is going to be built up there. And it's, you don't want to chase the commodity Right, the thing that's always going to be driven down in price, such as like programming talent. Something like audio engineering is more of a talent. You've got to understand acoustics and architecture and so forth. You want jobs that have not just a technology dimension, but a domain dimension. If you're in pharma, you've got to know about regulatory activities there, or energy, you've got to know about regulations and laws on top of being able to invert a matrix or do whatever technically. Yeah. So, and I think even for me at this age, I'm still trying to find that balance between the toolkit. Like I could stay up till four, morning, four in the morning and, and learn, you know, Julia Lang. I could do all this stuff at this age. Or do I want to go more deeply in, in reading about a legislation affecting the energy industry? There's so many different domains and knowing how to balance them. It's, I, I wish I had a good answer. I, I'm still trying to find that out. Yeah. Would maybe a, a decent way of putting it be focused on what's not automatable? 
That's absolutely right. But think about it. You know, okay. my friends who were attorneys are like, God, you know, AI, chat GPT is creating basic contracts or basic bond agreements. You know, a lot of things that are template and boilerplate that you, where you just insert low hanging you know, fruit. Amount, low hanging fruit. I mean, it's still, you still want a lawyer to, you know, you, you don't want to pay someone like $780 an hour to make yeah. sure it looks good. But what's to say that can't be automated? It's a bit deflationary, right? Because then there's well, a bunch of supply of lawyers, and if the low hanging fruit's covered. Sure. And that's the thing. You know, people complain about China. Well, China gave us low inflation. If you don't have unions maintaining wages, then all you can do is import cheaper stuff. Yeah. If the median wage, which has been relatively stagnant since the 1970s, median wage, not California, median U.S., hasn't really kept up with inflation that well. And if there's not a union there to defend their wage anymore, well, then all you're going to do is go to the cheapest producer who's going to pollute their backyard, right, and try to beat you in per capita GDP. You know, it, it's just the problem just kind of moves around. Someone else is getting polluted. You know, these batteries, we send all these electric scooters. I mean, yeah. that's incredible degradation to the environment. You know, gas and oil is putting a pipe in the ground and dumping in some surfactants and maybe steam and getting something out. But it's not expansively damaging, like hauling masses amount of earth to find a rare mineral. So the next OPEC is going to be the lithium producers and, and the nickel producers and chromium, things like that.